it was Christmas Eve. Outside the snow was falling steadily and the wind was howling in the dark night. I sat in perfect coziness beside what remained of the once rolling log fire in the grate and thought of Christmases past and of tomorrow when the whole family would be safely gathered in for Christmas Day, weather permitting. There was a thump and then another. Lazily I arose from my comfort and unlocked the door just long enough to peer across the rapidly forming white carpet. There was nobody about, and the fire was more inviting than the cold breath of winter. So I closed the door and returned to the sofa to share the ember's last moments. But the noise refused to go away. It now appeared to be coming from the other side of the small window above the kitchen table. Slowly I pulled back the curtain that kept the cold out and the light in. And there they were, birds, at least half a dozen, I think, flying against the window pane. The wind and snowstorm had clearly blown them off course, I presumed. And now they were lost, disorientated, unable to find their way home. But then they saw the light and felt the warmth and were doing their best to reach it. But it was never going to happen. Their efforts would only end in death. I ran out, chasing them away, but it wouldn't work. They just kept flying back and banging into the glass and the door. I ran to the barn and opened the doors wide. I tried to direct them inside I called to them, I shooed, I even ran out and got some corn and bread and laid a trail through the snow, all the way from the window right into the barn. But they wouldn't follow it. They didn't understand what I was trying to do. I knew they would die. If only I could have communicated with them in some other way, they would have realised the great danger they faced and that I wasn't trying to hurt them. I just wanted to save them. But we don't speak the same language. They're birds, and I'm a man. If only I could have become a bird like them, then they would have understood.
Tears are falling, hearts are breaking. How we need to hear from God. You've been promised, we've been waiting. Welcome, holy child. Welcome, holy child. That you don't mind our nature. How I wish we would have known. But long awaited, holy stranger, make yourself at home. Please make yourself at It's seriously busy. I mean, we've got 16 markets available at the moment, and the big ones are the date, when the baby will arrive, and the name. Famous London landmarks proclaim the news. Fountains turn blue. The new father let it be known that, quote, we could not be happier. The watchful glare of the world media. William and Kate. The bevalling van Kate Middleton.
I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the Maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We open presents, spend time with our family, eat too much food and generally relax. Spend it with our friends and family, opening presents and having Christmas lunch and watching TV. And we spend time together in our jammies, opening all the presents. As a parent, you, you, you learn with experience that the most important things in Christmas morning is to have extra pairs of scissors and loads of supplies of different sized batteries. It's just a big get together. Everybody eats too much and lays up and just enjoys the day and make, have fun with the children. A lot of running backwards and forwards after grandparents, a lot of cooking, a lot of eating, and then a lot of sleeping after Christmas Day to get over it. Everybody makes food and brings it to our house, and it's about 20 of us all have Christmas dinner together and spend the whole day together. It's about family just going to visit all the different relatives and making sure they all have a great day. Yes, it's that time again, isn't it? Bustling shopping malls, parties, dinners, putting up Christmas trees, coloured lights, decorations, mistletoe, Christmas wreaths, candles. We hunt for that special gift. Hope for snow, wrap our presents, order the turkey and all the trimmings. Push our way through the masses for those sprouts and the last mince pie. And then, we wait expectantly for Santa, if we've been good, and of course, the Queen's speech. And we indulge. Chocolates, selection boxes, as if there was no tomorrow. And that's Christmas. Or is it? Is that really what God intended? And is that really what we should intend it to be? To have a birthday party but not include the one whose birthday we get together to celebrate? Is it really just happy holidays now? No longer happy Christmas? Maybe it's time we had another look and discovered the glory of Christmas.
rubs the waters in the skies and shines the stars from far away. He makes the oceans fall and rise and marks the boundary of my day. At his rebuke, the heavens fear, and his still, small voice is ever near. And in creation, I can hear the whisper of his glory. He walks with Adam on the ground and makes a tent his dwelling place. He breathes <coughs> out fire within a cloud, consuming Israel's sacrifice. On Moses' face, he shines his light and leads his people day and night. And by his hand, the prophets write the coming of his glory. He comes to dwell, a selfless king, no longer hidden from our eyes. In these last days, he speaks again. His radiance in a manger lies, in human form revealed to man. With unveiled face, we see his plan. The coming of the great I am, the brightness of his glory. When they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him. It was now about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. For the sun stopped shining, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who had been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven.
the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him, all things were made. Without Him, nothing was made that has been made. For in Him, all things were created. <coughs> things in heaven and on earth. Mary, that young, anonymous girl from the backwaters of Nazareth, still in her teens, with her whole life ahead of her, and just about to become the most famous woman in history. So, as she sat there in the stable nursing her creator, I wonder what exactly she treasured and pondered in her heart. The promises of old? The words of the prophets? The strange birthplace? the quietness of the night, the visitors who came to see her new son, her faithful and courageous husband, that first visit by an angel, her own unworthiness to be the mother of the Son of God and his grace in choosing her, the miraculous conception that followed, her unplanned pregnancy and how she could explain it, her elderly cousin Elizabeth's unexpected son, the significance of those gifts, and maybe, just maybe, she pondered what the future held for her and Joseph and for Jesus.
between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. I will surely bless you, and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies, and through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. A star will come out of Jacob. A scepter will rise out of Israel. He will crush the foreheads of Moab, the skulls of all the people of Sheth. The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's star from between his feet until he to whom it belongs shall come, and the obedience of the nations will be his. He will tether his donkey to a vine, his cult to the choicest branch. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. <laughs> In his days, Judah will be saved, and Israel will live in safety. This is the name by which he will be called, the Lord, our righteous Saviour.
Father of God's special race, from whom someday would come Messiah, God's anointed one. Not for anything he had done, or for anything he would do, nor for having Adam's name in his ancient family tree. Abraham, simply chosen by grace. David, chosen by grace, to be the king of God's special race, from whom someday would come Emmanuel, God's royal son, shepherd boy of Bethlehem, but not the man he used to be, filled with shame for previous sin that clouds his many victories. David, simply chosen by grace. Mary, chosen by grace to be the mother of God's earthly face from whom someday would come Redeemer, God's glory shone, outside Nazareth unknown, yet selfless in her sacrifice, <coughs> obedient to a higher throne, a miracle lies within her, Mary, simply chosen by grace.
past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in many, many ways. But in these days, He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed heir of all things, and through whom also He made the universe. Surely the Sovereign Lord does nothing without revealing his plan to his servants, the prophets. And I will appoint him to be my firstborn, the most exalted of the kings of the earth. I will maintain my love to him forever. And my covenant with him will never fail. I will establish his line forever, his throne as long as the heavens endure. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, <laughs> whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. May the kings of Tarshish and of distant shores bring tribute to him. May the kings of Sheba and Seba Present him with gifts. Herds of camels will cover your land, young camels of Midian and Ephah, and all from Sheba will come, bearing gold and incense and proclaiming the praise of the Lord. When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. A voice is heard in Ramah, mourning and great weeping. Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and he'll be called Emmanuel. Arise, shine, for your light has come and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. <coughs> of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Please don't molest us for this next one.
It was Caesar Augustus, or to give him his proper name, Caius Octavius, grand nephew and adopted son of Julius Caesar, who ordered that the world under Roman rule would be registered every 14 years. This census was primarily designed to register young men for military service and also to number each nation under its family and tribe. Joseph, being a Judean, had to return to his ancestral home to be registered. She has a nerve coming in here for coffee. Who has a nerve? That young Mary one. Look at her. Brazen wee hussy. I'd be hiding myself in a cupboard. Yeah, or moving away for a while. Sure, the young ones have no shame nowadays. Didn't you teach her in P7? Aye, and the rest of her family. Not great stock, you know. No, sure half the time she came to school with no lunch and maybe holes in her sandals and never a note to say why. It's that young Joseph I pity. How did he ever get implicated with her? And now, well, confidentially, I hear he's going to marry her. Somebody says they're related, way back. Oh, sure aren't we all. Have you heard the story she's made up? Ah, uh, just bits and pieces at the school gate. Well, I don't want to be one to be talking about people, so keep it to yourself. Well, you know, you can trust me. So, what did you hear? Well, she says that she was visited by an angel called Gabriel one night. I know where she's got that from. Sure, her relative, Elizabeth's husband, said he was visited by the same angel before the birth of young John. Aye, I heard that too. Anyway, this angel tells her that she is going to be a mother because God has favoured her. I mean, Mary, of all people. Surely there's better young girls than her. She was only average in my class. And mine too. But here's the big one. She says that this angel tells her that there will be no man involved, just the Holy Spirit. And the baby, he will be God's son. I mean, did you ever? You are kidding. That is absolutely shocking. What a nerve. Why doesn't she just come out and tell the truth? Sure, you only read about angels in those old scrolls in the temple. I tell you this, that young lady will not have her sorrows to seek. Aye, <laughs> and you haven't heard the half of it. Now she's saying that her ancestor is King David and that she's still a virgin. They've even thought of a name for the baby already. Wait till you hear this. Listen, do you want another cup of coffee? Oh, I don't mind if I do. Of course, I'm only telling you all this because I know you're totally confidential. Anyway, they say that she went all the way by herself to Elizabeth's house on her dad's donkey. <laughs> but the angel said to her, <clears throat> Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favour with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great, and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be? Mary asked the angel. Since I am a virgin, the angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. So the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. <coughs> we have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father full of grace and truth.
Unto us a child is born, in a humble Bethlehem stable, and no one else knows that he has come, except his father and the angels. A child whose birth will chart our years, whose arrival is a mystery, whose name will one day come to be most famous in all of history. Unto us a child is born to fulfill what has been written. While all the leaders of the church wait for a more royal occasion, a child whose future is decided, whose humble parents must suffer loss, whose human form must walk the road from the manger to the cross. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, in humility and helplessness. God comes down to earth from heaven. A child whose birth we celebrate, whose life's a well-known story, whose death divides what we believe and shows his Father's glory.
when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. <coughs> he went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them.
The headlines tonight. Reports that Keane Herod has been unwell remain unconfirmed. Crowds protested XX taxation. And as the census nears completion, whole families flock to their ancestral towns and cities to be registered before the deadline. And what was that strange phenomenon in the sky? Astronomers are still puzzled. In sport, Bethlehem play host to Jerusalem in a top of the table clash this evening. And the weather. Looks like that heat wave will continue for another few years. But first, some breaking news. Rumours circulating around Bethlehem that a king has been born. Let's go live to David Blevins in the city. David, can you confirm any of these rumours? Well, Bethlehem is packed to capacity. So many people have come down here to be registered. In fact, there's not a hotel room or bed and breakfast available. We've spoken to some local residents and they've seen nothing unusual, nothing to suggest that a king has been born around here. And within the last few minutes, the scholars in the temple have given us their first reaction to these reports. All they would say is that according to their ancient manuscripts, a king was to be born in Bethlehem, which is of course the city of David, the great ancient king of Israel and descendant of Abraham and Judah. To be honest though, looking for a newborn king here is a bit like searching for a needle in a haystack. There has been no record of a royal birth at the palace, at the hospital, or at any of the hotels or guest houses. But do bear in mind that some of the babies born during the census may not have been registered yet. And what do you think King Herod would make of all of this? Well, I can't imagine he'd be too impressed, especially if, as the rumours suggest, this newborn king will one day be ruler of Israel. There is some history here already, of course. Herod is a descendant of Esau, and most people know that the father of the nation of Israel was none other than his brother Jacob. They weren't exactly the best of friends, so there's potential for tension. Let's just watch this space. Thank you, David. Now on to other news. Thank you. 
born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod. Magi from the east came to Jerusalem. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. And on coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down, and they worshipped him. Then they opened their treasure and presented him with gifts of gold, of frankincense, and myrrh. We're returning to our Bethlehem correspondent, David Blevins, for an update in the situation in the city. David, I, I gather you have some interesting information for us. Yes, Ben, a short time ago, one of our contacts here told us several men had been seen entering a house just off the town square. Now, these men, from what they were wearing, were not from around these parts. Our source suggests they may have come from much further east. They carried with them a number of unidentifiable packages and after a short stay emerged from the house, climbed back onto their camels but strangely enough did not leave by the road that would have taken them straight to the east. So you're at the house now? That's right, but the family is long gone. Apparently they did what we'd call a midnight flit and were last seen heading along the road towards Egypt. So that's probably the last we'll see or hear of them. Thanks again, David. And now on to the sports headlines. Yeah. 
In a follow-up to our earlier story about a rumored birth of a king in Israel, let's return to our Bethlehem correspondent, David Blevins. David, some shocking news I understand. Yes, Ben, we have tragic news of an atrocity, unprecedented in Israel and certainly here in Bethlehem. Late last night, soldiers of King Herod marched into town, smashed their way into homes, and just began slaughtering innocent children. Any idea what was the motive behind such an attack? Obviously ordered by King Herod, I presume. That would seem to be the case. There's no clear reason for these murders, for this apparent genocide. But we do know King Herod has been greatly unsettled by rumours of a new king being born in the last couple of years. And his forces do seem to be targeting boys up to the age of two, during whose lifetime these rumours have been circulating. But there's been no official statement from the palace. Thanks again, David. That was David Blevins, live in Bethlehem. And now another news.
After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel. For those who were trying to take the child's life are dead. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning in Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee, and he went and lived in a town called Nazareth. So was fulfilled what was said through the prophets, that he would be called a Nazarene. Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servants in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the light of all the nations, a light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. And the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom and the grace of God was on him. I want the boys to grow up happy and be good Christians and to respect others. The main hope I would have for my children is they're happy, that uh, they go through life and enjoy every bit of it, that they make the most of everything they have, the opportunities they have, the talents they have, and that they look back on their life and say, I had a great time. The biggest thing I hope for them is that they are happy in life, happy and healthy, and to find their own path um, and just to be happy doing what they love doing. As children, I would like them to remain together as friends um, through, through life. I think that's the most important thing and they'll always be there for each other because they mightn't always have their, their parents to, to guide them. I just hope uh, that my children will take on board uh, the uh, lessons they are learnt in life or they are taught in life and the lessons they learn themselves and put them to good use for their future. Hopefully the, the, the two boys will look after me um, when I'm older and get a good education if possible. I hope our children live long and healthy lives, that they achieve everything I know they are capable of achieving. I hope that they are happy and successful and that they will treat people with kindness and respect. <coughs> When you, sit, when you wish and wait with anticipation for the baby in your arms, the child at your table, to grow up and fulfill all the dreams and hopes you have for them before their story is written. But above all, treasure those moments while they still sit at your table. Mary treasured those moments while she sat and pondered with the shepherds kneeling before her son as God's chosen one, knowing he would never fulfill all the dreams and hopes she had for him, because his story was already written. So she would treasure those moments while they sat in the stable. Mary treasured those moments as she sat and remembered with amazement how the angel had announced the miraculous conception, knowing that he would become the Sovereign Lord and King, her Saviour, the determiner of our destiny. So, she treasured those moments between the cross and the cradle. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us.
when it comes to the uh, Christmas story, a lot of time is spent rightly on the who and the when and the how. But just for a few moments tonight, I want us to think of the why question. Why? Why did God come to us? Why all those promises over all those years, those centuries, why? Why that great sacrifice? Why the cost? Why? Well, thankfully, we're not left to guess. Jesus tells us in a verse in Luke chapter 19. It's the end of the story of Zacchaeus. Jesus tells us, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. That's the why answered. Simple, isn't it? But profound. This was a mission statement before mission statements were popular. Think about the person. For the Son of Man came. The Son of Man is a title for Jesus. Another name for him. And he came. He came to us. One of the central truths of Christianity is that God came to us. God came to us. The infinite became a little infant. The eternal one stepped into time. The creator of the universe was born on a little lump of rock called Earth. He came. That's the person. But think of the purpose. Why did he come? To seek and to save. And that's good. Because I can't save myself. And neither can you. And I wouldn't want to seek him. And neither would you. He's a seeking God. And he's a saving God. That's what he does. And many of you here tonight are saved because he sought you. Long before he saved you, he was seeking you. And think of the sorts of people that he seeks and saves. Back in Bible times, he saved people like terrorists, would you believe it? Prostitutes. Rich people, poor people. Sick people, young people, old people. All kinds of people. Fishermen, tax collectors. The whole gamut of people. He sought them. And he saved them. And that's what he does. And that's why he came. And you know what? He could well be seeking after you. Pursuing you. Wooing you. Loving you. Because he wants you. He wants to save you. That's why he came. But what kind of people does he seek? What kind of people does he see it? Well, the answer is in the last bit. What was lost? What was lost? We don't like to use that word nowadays. You know. But mankind, like God, is lost. All you want to do is watch the news. Open a newspaper. And you see man without God is lost. All you've got to do is look in the mirror and you will see a person without God is lost. <coughs> and those are the kind of people Jesus seeks and saves. We're lost, horribly lost. Very often we're lost in a, a horrible, tangled mess of sin, a tangled mess of selfishness, addictions, And if you're honest with yourself tonight, if you're not a Christian, you know there's a mess of all kinds of intricate, horrible things 
that are causing you nothing but misery. You're lost. But Jesus <coughs> could well be seeking you tonight because Jesus may want to save you tonight. But how? Well, the next verse that we want to look at, just as the last verse, tells us how he does it. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on the earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. That's how he did it, you see. He came to die. He came to die. He came to die so that lost people, lost people that he was seeking, could be saved. Jesus loves you. And he went to the trouble of becoming just like you. To seek you. And to save you. And to make you whole. And to make you his. And he did it by dying on the cross. A horrible death. And shortly we're going to hear songs about that. And a few readings too. You're lost without Christ. But perhaps tonight, perhaps tonight is the end of, of a long journey, a journey of doubt, a journey of despair, a journey of questions, and you've come to the end, and now is the time. You might ask me, Alistair, how, 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 how do I do this? If Jesus is seeking me, and I desperately want him. I want to be saved. How do I do it? Well, I wish I could give you the ABC, but I can only give you the A, B, R. First of all, A, admit. Admit that you're lost. Go on. Admit what is true. Admit what is obvious. <coughs> that you're a sinner. You sin and thought and want to admit it. B, believe. Believe that this God came down to earth and died in your place. He shed his blood on the cross for you. Believe it. In your head, in your heart, believe it. And then they are. Receive. Receive them into your life. Ask him. Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. Lord Jesus, you died for my sin to pay the price of it. I want to be saved. Come and be my savior. Admit, believe, <coughs> receive. And you know what? Then, and only then, Will you be able to understand <coughs> glory, the glory of Jesus, and the glory of what he has done, and the glory of what he will give to us in heaven? <coughs> Admit, believe, receive. That's the way home. Because he's seeking and he's saving.
Tonight we are returning to a story from over 30 years ago and we are joined by our Jerusalem correspondent David Blevins. Good evening David. Well there's just been a crucifixion here, a truly horrific scene and within the last few minutes we've had a bit of an earthquake as well. But what drew my attention was the sign above the middle cross of the three. It read, and I quote, King of the Jews. And that reminded me of a story I covered many years ago when I was a correspondent in Bethlehem, the rumoured birth of a new king of Israel. So do you think there's some link between the two events? Well, I've done some research and it appears the man on the middle cross was born around the time I was reporting in Bethlehem. But that's not all. The Herod who is ruling here now is the son of the Herod who ordered the murders of all those little boys in Bethlehem many years ago. So maybe they got their man in the end. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. For surely it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. For this reason he had to be made like them, fully human in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. After Jesus said this, he looked towards heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you have given me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began.
If Jesus hadn't come to earth, we'd have no Christmas celebrations, no carols sung about his birth, no trees adorned with decorations, no Christmas cards with manger scenes, no Santa-driven expectations, no special festive day cuisine without God's glorious incarnation. If Jesus hadn't come to earth, born of the spirit and of woman, to live a humble servant's birth, to live a humble servant's life, yet fully God and fully human, to be like us in every way, to thirst, to tire, to cry, to hunger, he never would complete God's plan to rescue us from certain danger. If Jesus hadn't come to earth with power to conquer all temptation, to live a, a perfect sinless life and be the saviour of all nations, there'd be no cross to bear our sins, no Easter Sunday resurrection, no future hope through faith in him without that wondrous incarnation.
The word of the Father, by whom all time was created, was made flesh and born in time for us. He without whose divine permission no day completed its course, wished to have one of those days for his human birth. In the bosom of his Father he existed before all the cycles of the ages. Born of an earthly mother, he entered on the course of the years on that very day. The maker of man became man, that he, the ruler of the stars, might be nourished at the breast, that he, the bread, might be hungry, that he, the fountain, might be thirst, that he, the light, might sleep, that he, the way, might be wearied in the journey, that he, the truth, might be accused by false witnesses, that he, the judge of the living and the dead, might be brought to trial by a mortal judge, that he, justice itself, might be condemned by the unjust, that he, discipline personified, might be scourged with a whip, that he, the foundation, might be suspended on a cross, that he, courage incarnate, might be weak, and he, security itself, might be wounded, and he, life itself, might die.